I got a question. How was everybody's Thanksgiving? Great, good. That's wonderful. All righty. You did a great job this morning. Thank you. Thank you for sharing in that worship experience with us. Um, I got a question for you. Have you ever thought or have your mom or dad ever said, I've got eyes in the back of my head. I'm watching you. Have they ever said that? I hear some laughing back there. Yours do? Mm. Have your parents ever told you that, that they've got eyes in the back of their head? They haven't? Parents? What's up with that? You're missing a big key point of parenthood. Your dad does? Well, let me tell you a little secret. When I was a little girl, and even when I was in middle school, and even when I was a teenager, I didn't always do what I should do. I made lots of bad choices, and I got in lots of trouble with my mom. It seemed like I did it all the time. And you know what? She always caught me. No matter what I did, she, would, if she told me not to go out of the yard and I snuck out of the yard, guess what? She would catch me. No matter what I did, she would catch me. And you know what she told me? I've got eyes in the back of my head so she could see everything. And I believed her. I, even when I was a little girl and I would sit in the back of the, you know when your mom's driving and you're in the back seat and you can see the back of her head? I would search her head. I would just stare at the back of her head knowing that I could find the eyes, that they were back there because she always caught me all the time. But now, did my mom really have eyes in the back of her head? No, it felt like that because I was always in trouble, but she didn't. She was just a good mama who knew what I was, who knew her daughter. But God tells us that he can see us always. He can see what you're doing. He knows that you're sitting right here at church right this minute. God knows when you're happy. He knows when you're sad. He knows when you're having good thoughts. And he knows when you're having those bad thoughts like I'm going to kill my sister. He knows that. God knows everything. He sees us in everything. Now, does that, does that, you knowing that God sees you and God knows what you're thinking and God knows what you're feeling, is that a good feeling for you or is that kind of a scary feeling? What? It's good. It's good? Yeah. Does sometimes it scare you? Do you ever think things that you don't want God to know you're thinking? I do. But you know what? He does know because he is an all-knowing God and he loves us. And you know what? What we are thinking, no matter what we're doing, he knows us and he loves us in spite of it. So we are getting ready to start our Advent season. That means we're getting ready to celebrate the best gift of all that God has ever given us, which is the gift of who? Jesus. Jesus, that's right. And Jesus gave us the best gift of all when he died on the cross for us. So remember, there's never a time that you're ever alone. How did he die on the cross? He was crucified. That was a good question. There's never a time that you're alone. There's never a time that you're without God, because he sees you always, he knows you inside and out, and he's always there for you, okay? All right, let's thank God for that. Dear God, thank you for loving us, for always watching over us, for knowing our hearts, and knowing our feelings. We love you, God, and we thank you for the gift of Jesus. Amen. Good morning, everybody. As Pastor has already explained, my name is Faith Philo Kunhira. 
and I'm the founder and executive director of the organization of Bringing Hope to the Family, an organization that has a children's home that has about 146 children that we take care of that are completely, completely uh, abandoned and destitute. Our organization has a vocational school that takes care of young girls and gives them skills. We run a medical facility that takes care of about 1,300 HIV positive people, of which about 260 are children below the age of 18. Our organization does a number of things. We run a pregnancy crisis center in the same community, and we also have a church that continues to speak and to preach the gospel. Over the last years that pastor was in Kaihura, our church has grown, and of recent we abolished, we demolished our church to be able to expand the church. The organization has called a tremendous change in the community, and people are coming to church, and the church has become smaller. And we are in the stages of constructing our church and the stages of having it roofed, uh, where we are still struggling to have it roofed. I want to thank this church for the continued support and love for the people of Kaihura. And I want to welcome you to Kaihura. Uganda is no longer the Uganda that people hear about, about Idi Amin. It's a different Uganda, it's a beautiful country. You can come for both mission and tour and we'll be able to receive you and welcome you. Thank you so much for the continued support towards the children and towards the people of Uganda. May God bless you. So it's not the first Sunday of Advent. <laughs> And so God works in mysterious ways. <laughs> and so let there be light. So I invite you in this in-between Sunday to hear yet just a snippet from what we see of that Christmas story. We find it in Luke, the second chapter, verses 27 through 34. And then we'll go over to John with a scripture passage I can almost guarantee no preacher is preaching from this Sunday. But from Luke, the second chapter, beginning with verse 27. Moved by the Spirit, Simeon went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, now dismiss your service in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to be the cause to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a son that will be spoken against. And then on a Sunday that should be before Easter, Palm Sunday, we would hear this triumphal entry account over in John, the 12th chapter, verse 12 and 13. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. So I can imagine some of you already scratching your heads and wondering if I have somehow forgotten that this is not Palm Sunday, but it is the beginning of the Christmas season. A time for us to now appropriately look at the joy, the birth, the anticipation of Christmas. Certainly not suffering rejection, Definitely not death. No doubt the story of the Annunciation would be a much more appropriate story for us all to hear on this Sunday before Advent begins. That wonderful touching story where the angel appears to Mary and startles her with the unimaginable news that she will be the bearer of the long-awaited Messiah. But instead, we have this strangely moving story of the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It's cross currents, it's difficult moods, where we hear that unimaginable contrast, where just on a, one day they are shouting, Hosanna, <laughs> blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then they, before, they, before they can turn around, they're shouting, crucify him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. The somber reading of this story 
which suggests to me that before we go hopping and dancing and hanging tinsel and lights and singing Christmas carols in this season, we do well as a church and God's people to at least pause for a moment and ask the question, do we really want this God to come that we celebrate coming at Christmas? Because you see here in this season, the church well remembers this God, this God who came in Jesus Christ was the God that nobody wanted. It's perfectly understandable, I get that, if you don't want to remember that kind of thing. After all, who wants to pour cold water on such a special season? God knows Christmas comes so quickly, and then it's gone just like that, and all we're left with are the long winter nights. But we must not forget that this God who comes to us in the delightful settings of the angels and shepherds in the manger was in fact the God that nobody wanted. We see this at every point of his life. Born in a stable because there was no room for him in the end. Forced to flee to Egypt because already he was a threat to Herod. Kicked out of his hometown after the opening sermon. His family was continually bewildered by him. The good religious leaders plotted in order to get rid of him. Herod, who was a symbol of authority and power, tried to wash his hands of him. And finally, his own chosen disciples finally fled and forsook him and joined together in a radical conspiracy to be a part of what eventually led to his very death on an ugly cross. All this we must remember as we go galloping so lightly into Advent. And this God... This Christmas King was, in fact, the God that nobody wanted. Yeah, it's so nice. We love to sing as we did earlier, O come, O come, Emmanuel. But we ought to at least ask the question, do we really want this kind of God to come into our life? This God nobody, in fact, did want when he did come. For they make no mistake about it. When he comes and if he comes into your life, it's always going to be on his terms and not yours. So maybe we need to consider again what kind of God this God really is that we say we so much want to come into our lives so we don't repeat what that Palm Sunday crowd did where they so easily, well, of course we want him and we praise that triumphal entry only when they finally realized for what he was, put him away so they didn't have to deal with him any longer. Notice in the first place, when we sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel, we are singing about a God who is our constant companion, a companion from whom there is simply no break, no escaping, morning, nighttime. When you go to work, when you are at home, when you're lying on the beach at Nags Head, when you've had one too many at the Christmas party, when you're filling out your tax returns, He's always there. Not just when we come here on Sunday morning in our Sunday morning finest best, but he's always there. To be sure, that's part of what we celebrate about Jesus. We want him to always be there to provide comfort and to watch over us and protect us. But if you're like me, you probably think of twice at least a little bit. But we hear him say, lo, I am with you always. Always means always. We can't get rid of him. We can't shake him. Maybe the psalmist was having an awareness of that when he wrote those words. If I ascend into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, there's still there. If I take the wings in the morning and dwell in the innermost parts of the sea, even there, who wants a companion that you never get a break from? You know, sometimes when I do weddings, I get a kick out of being back there in the choir room. You know, the groom and best man are back there getting ready to come in for the wedding. And the groom, he usually walks about five miles inside that one room. He defies all nature by going to the bathroom three different times in 10 minutes. 
And somewhere along the way, he may ask me, is everybody always this nervous? I say, no, you're the, probably the worst I've ever seen. Uh, yeah. But part of the nervousness, you know, maybe it is for some that they're having to stand up in front of a crowd. I, I, I hear that does happen with people. But my guess is what the real problem is, is that it's about to hit them what they're about to do. That they're about to enter into a relationship that's supposed to be for a dead all lifetime. And all of a sudden, this awareness is like, what have I gotten myself into? You know, at least husbands and wives can get a break every now and then. That's what golf is for. And, you know, watching, maybe going shopping or whoever. That's, I don't want to be sexist here. Uh, we, we can get a break from each other at least every now and then. But this God, his name is Emmanuel, which means God is with us. We shall never be rid of him again. Do we really want this kind of God to come? But perhaps more disturbing than that this constant companion is always, always with us is that he is not under our control. <laughs> While Aladdin's genie, we could summon him at will and then bottle him up when we don't want him anymore. You don't get that kind of choice when it comes to Jesus. He comes on his terms and not ours. You see, the trouble with the Christ child is that he grew up. <laughs> Wouldn't it been nice if we could just kept him in control and kept him in the manger and been a nice, sweet little thing that we could be in charge of. But even before he became a teenager, he was already giving his parents sleepless nights. Because this child, this child in the manger, he developed a will of his own. And he refused to be controlled, so much so that in the end, nearly everybody, his parents, his friends, the church people, the government authorities, they all just ultimately gave up on him as hopeless. This sweet little Jesus boy, he became impossible to control. And we've never been able to control him since. So do you really want this Christ to come into your life? This child, this Christ child who grows up and makes claims on our lives, who hits us in the face with demands that are so deep and wide that we've really never hardly taken them seriously, like deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. The scary thing is not only did this constant companion refuse to be controlled, he expects to control us. Invite him into your life. And the next thing he knows, he's acting like he's in charge. Like he's the master of our lives. Like he's the one who's supposed to be Lord of all that we are. And this is why I think Jesus warned us in no uncertain terms to count the cost before we get carried away with all the sentimental wonder of the Christmas season. For his, Jesus he grows up, he's not satisfied, folks, to be just found in our Christmas carols and on our Christmas cards. He's not satisfied until he has a place in our hearts, in our wills, in our souls. He's not here to make us better men and women. He's here to make us new men and women to make us not just delighted spectators before the wonderful pageantry of the shepherds and manger and all that, but rather to make us disciples, to make us servants of the one who gave his life for us and now expects all of our lives as well. Could it be that maybe this is why Simeon said to Mary, behold, this child is set for the fall and the rising of many. For if the question were asked of all of us, do you really want this child who grew up to be Christ to come into your life? I don't know about you, but I know how many times, how many, many times, my most honest response by the evidence of my life would be, well, not quite that much. Not quite that much. I don't want you always, I don't want you to be completely, I still have my will and my way, 
And sometimes that's what I really want first and foremost. And so Jesus says, and the story says, this will be the rise and the fall of many. And so we stand on the edge of Advent. And my friends, Christ, the last thing he wants is our destruction. Not that we're going to be eternally shut off from his love, but that we're going to miss it somehow in the very living of our days on this side of heaven. That he is not here for our destruction. He is here to raise us up. That we not fall in terms of falling short of the best version of ourselves and the best version of the life he wants for us. But that he is here to raise us up to newness of life. As the Christmas carol so wonderfully and appropriately sings. Light and life to all he brings. Risen with healing in his wings. Born to raise the sons of earth. Born to give them second birth. But, but he comes on his terms and not on ours. He is Emmanuel. And unless by the manner in which we live, we can finish the words of that Christmas carol. Unless we can truly sing, hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Unless we can with fear and trembling and maybe more faith than we've often shown in our lives, allow him to enter into our life, then we cannot really fully know that fullness of life that is the gift that he wants us to know. I was moved by the words of John Paul II back in, Pope John Paul II, back in 1978, his inauguration. He said to the nations, do not be afraid to welcome Christ and his authority. Have no fear, open the doors, fling them open to Christ and to his authority. And why should we be afraid of that kind of thing? <coughs> For this Christ, this Christmas King, he comes also as our Savior, set not only for the fall, but also for the rising of all those who want to invite him to come in fully. This constant companion who longs to have control, and wouldn't it be better some days if he were in control than the way we've done in our trying to control things? And so the question, do you really want this kind of God to come? This God who never leaves you, but this God who saves you from all that you need saving from. And so can we sing the song? Oh, come, come to my heart, Lord Jesus. There is room in my heart for you. Our hymn of invitation this morning it's hymn number 165, Thou didst leave thy throne. There be any this morning who wish to give your life to Christ or unite with this church from another church family or some recommitment of your life, I'll be the front to receive you. Let us stand this thing to the glory of God. Hymn number 165. say again a word of welcome to guests that are with us. We celebrate that you've added to our company and we have a guest reception room over to the side. Mike Dishman from our outreach team would be happy to meet with you and share any information or just get to know you better. I hope you'll stop by there. Again, next Sunday, Hanging of the Greens. This room will look different a week from now in all its glory. There are tickets out there just simply to use as a way of inviting others. They're not required, no cost. But take one, invite somebody, a very special experience next Sunday. Order your poinsettia, make a reservation for the Christmas banquet, and on and on, whatever the list is. I uh, hope you'll be faithful to it all. So glad that you're here. Let us now bow for the benediction, the response to follow. Christ before you, Christ behind you, Christ within you. 
grace upon grace, mercy upon mercy, love, all love, Jesus Christ our Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you.